I'm Gary and this is episode 79 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at how to pay for your charge. Before we start, I wanted to remind you that next week is the season finale for season three. I've got a round table set up with a couple of names that will be familiar to those of you in the EV scene. Look out for that next week. Our main topic of discussion today is paying for your charge. Way back in the midst of time when the world was black and white, there was only one way to pay for public charging, an RFID card. You wrote to the supplier, which in the UK was probably one of the pioneering CPOs such as Ecotricity, and they sent you back a credit card-like piece of plastic. You turned up at a charger, flashed the card, and it allowed you to charge. Payment at that time was often free, but when they did start charging, your RFID card was linked to an account under which you either preloaded money or you had a payment card on file. Since then, the world has moved on. Charging has increased drastically, both in terms of where to charge and how to charge. The methods of payment surrounding this have also changed. As of sometime last year, the government in the UK put in place a mandate that all new charges had to have a method of ad hoc payment. Many people took this to mean that you could just turn up at a charger and flash a contactless payment card and it would work. But that's not entirely accurate. Ad hoc payment means you don't need a subscription or an account or a user profile or an app to pay. It means, for example, you can turn up at a charger and follow the instructions on the charger to register your payment online. Some charges use QR codes, some send you to a specific website to enter your card details, and these are all considered ad hoc payments. There are still multiple other methods of payment, and we'll talk about what they are a little later. But what most people want is the ability to flash a card at a screen and just start your charge. Well, I say that when we talked to BP Pulse in episode 69, Tom Callow told us the following regarding why they have numerous methods of payment. There's going to be a lot of people who rely on public charging, and there, there already are. Um, there, there are customers of ours who, who do something in, in the magnitude of about forty five to 50,000 miles a year of public charging mm. just on our network. I mean, I think the fact that they're doing 54, 45, 50,000 miles a year on public charging alone is very impressive, but the fact they're doing it on just our network is, is you know, really, really impressive. So there's going to be people who really rely on it. And for those people, I think it's really important that we try and ensure that there isn't a huge disparity between the sort of average cost per kilowatt hour that they are going to be paying and the kind of pricing that you can expect on a domestic supply. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with a, with a sort of social justice issue where those that it's a bit of a you know, haves and have nots, where the people who can bluntly afford a house with a driveway will, be, will benefit hugely compared to people who don't have that. And that's, that's not a situation that anyone wants to see, it's certainly not a situation that what the government wants to see. So it's really important that those regular users can access something that allows them to get pricing on a lower, a, you know, a, a lower cost basis. I think that's where things like our subscription model really win in the market is that that gives that regular user those, those, those prices that, that come to the point where they really can't see much difference between, between those prices and charging pain, for example. And for, for the ad hoc customers, for the, sort of, you know, for the pay-as-you-go users, some of these people only use this once, twice a year. It's 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 not something that they're going to sort of dwell on as a as a comparator cost because they, it's not something that they are using as a as an alternative. If that makes sense, it's a it's a one off or a very rare cost. Yeah. So, I think the in general, what we've got to be mindful of is is providing choice and is ensuring that the public charging infrastructure is available for those for those people who regularly need it. So there are people who want a card linked to an account, and if you're a BP Pulse user doing forty thousand plus electric miles per year, you're going to want to find a subscription to keep that price down. So what I want to do today is to go through the various methods of paying for a charge. And in this context, when I say paying for, I mean initiating a charge, and in certain cases, the charge you get will be free. So in fact, let's start there. If you go to many of the pod point charges that are dotted around the place, especially the seven kilowatt or 22 kilowatt ones, you'll find that they're free of charge. But you can't just turf up, stick your charger cable in and expect them to charge. Well, actually, with pop point you can, but if that's all you do, your charge will end about 15 minutes. Usually, you have to initiate the charge somehow, even if it's free. Pod point has an app. Once your charge is started, you need to go into the app, locate the charger you're on, and confirm the charge. 
If it's free, you won't be charged. If it's a 50 kilowatt charger, you'll be charged at whatever the going rate is, usually around 23 pence per kilowatt hour. And this will be linked to an account you have with the payment method. There are several systems that work like this. Use an app, make an account, pay via a card linked to the account. Ecotricity is now one of those. It, it ditched the RFID cards for new customers quite a while back. The follow-up to that is those networks which allow you to initiate a charge by using an RFID card. The RFID card is linked to an account which is linked to a payment card. New Motion is an example of this. The beauty of the New Motion card is that it's usually acceptable at several different charging networks. New Motion is owned by Shell, so obviously you can use it at Shell garages, but you can also use it at 3,200 charge points on 17 networks in the UK as well as 818 rapid charge points. The networks that are part of these 17 include the Ionity network, although the price for charging on an Ionity charger with new motion is an eye in 61 pence per kilowatt hour according to the website. I'm not sure how accurate that is as the Ionity usually, units usually start at 69 pence per kilowatt hour if you're not using a manufacturer service plan from one of the founding automotive members. You also have access to over 180,000 charge points across 35 countries with New Motions card. The issue with these sort of payment processes is that if you're doing a road trip and using more than one of these networks, such as when Simon and I did our 1,000 kilometer road trip for season one, you might need to carry around a number of RFA ID cards or apps on the phone. And that's one reason that the government in the UK mandated ad hoc payment cards. Since then, the majority of the networks have added simple payment initiation using a contactless card. Flash the card at the reader, follow the instructions, and the charge is made. The downside to this method of payment is that when you flash the card to make the payment, there's a pre-charge made to your card to ensure you have funds to cover the cost of the charging. It varies from network to network, but it can be £20 or more. If you have an issue with a charge and you have to reinitiate it, another prepayment will be made. These can add up quite quickly if you're doing numerous charges in a day. Of course, they will ultimately be removed from your account once the actual payment is processed for the charge you made. But in the meantime, that can be a chunk of change you're losing short term. Networks which do this include Instavolt, who are contactless payment only, Osprey Charging, and we'll come to them in a minute, BP Pulse on their non-subscription and non-app basis, and Shell Recharge. But as we learned from Tom Callow, the reason there are numerous methods of paying for a charge is because it provides flexibility to people. Some want centralised billing, some want discounted prices via the subscription, some want contactless. Which brings us to our next type of payment or initiation process, the subscription. BP Pulse pioneered this back when they were called Polar. For a fixed amount of, per month, you get access to their network where you can charge for a discounted price. As an illustration, if you go to a 150 kilowatt rapid charger and access it using contactless, you'll be charged 42 pence per kilowatt hour. If you use the same charger with a BP Pulse subscription RFID card, the charge drops to 27 pence per kilowatt hour. A BP Pulse subscription costs £7.85 per month. Osprey Charging recently started a subscription offering. When Osprey Charging CEO Ian Johnson was on the podcast, he implied that they wanted a single price for their offering to make it simple. But Osprey too have realised that customers wanted discounts for more charging and some sort of centralised billing system for fleets. So the Osprey subscription was born. For £5 per month, you can benefit from £25 per kilowatt hour charging at all chargers at any speed. GridServe, which is building a network of electric forecourts across the country, currently has 24 pence per kilowatt hour charging for all of its units, regardless of power. But it's also future-proofing itself by ensuring they're ready for a subscription service too. I've recorded an interview with Sam Clark, the Chief Vehicle Officer at GridServe, and that will be out early in next season's run. So we've looked at the key methods of payment that exist at the moment for charging your car. We've got contactless, RFID card for a single network, RFID card for numerous networks, an app for a network, and subscription services. There are, however, a couple of other ways that you can pay for your charge. And this now starts to get into the area that has the most potential for the future. ZapMap have brought out ZapPay. 
This is an app-based payment method, similar to many that are out there at the moment. And the difference here is that with ZapPay, you aren't limited to just one network. At the moment, ZapPay works with Osprey Charging, and they recently linked up with ESB Charging, who are big in central London and Coventry, of all places. Now, even though this is app-based, it works differently to other app-based systems in that you don't need a separate user profile to use ZapPay. It's integrated into the existing ZapMap app, try saying that three times quickly, and each time you select a payment method from those on file. It starts to charge, allows you to monitor what's happening, and when finished, even allows you to download a receipt. The main issue at the moment with ZapMap is that it's restricted to those networks who've opted to link in for their payment process. Osprey Charging have done this because their backend system allows this integration by design. But if you look at the recently published list of the highest rated network providers, ESB, the other uh, Zap Pay network, it comes seventh in the list behind networks such as Podpoint, Shell Recharge, and Instavolt. For ZapPay to really benefit users, it will need to focus on getting some of these big boys on board. I'm hoping to get Melanie Shufflebottom from ZapMap onto the podcast next season to discuss the rollout of ZapPay and what progress is being made with the other CPOs. The next method of payment is one which I see being fairly critical as we move forward with widespread rollout of EVs. It's the ability to charge a car and have the payment added to your home electricity bill. The potential here is huge, especially in the world where we currently are with numerous apps, RFID cards and payment tariffs. At the moment, this offering is restricted to one company, Octopus Energy. They've gone down the route of providing a service which amalgamates charges from several different charge providers and drops that onto a single bill. It's called Octopus Electric Juice. If you're a customer of Octopus Energy, the bill will be linked to your Octopus Energy account and it will be paid automatically with your current monthly direct debit. But if you're not an Octopus customer, they will bill you separately each month for your electricity usage. It works via an RFID card and currently it's linked in with Osprey Charging, Franklin's Life, Alpha Power, Hubster, Chargey and the Plug and Go networks. Uh, Worth noting there's also no premium for charging on these networks using the Octopus Electric Juice. The benefit of something like Electric Juice and ZapPay is that as the networks get added, you're left with a single payment option across multiple charge point operators. This makes it easier to charge and less hassle. At the moment, both ZapPay and Octopus Electric Juice are UK only. Hopefully as we go forward, they'll link agreements with some European providers and extend their scope with that. Incidentally, I'll be doing an episode on European charging in the new season. If you've ever wanted to head across the channel and visit our European friends, uh, visa and passport issues notwithstanding, it would be worth listening to that episode. Finally, I want to talk about the holy grail of charger payment and initiation, plug and charge. This was obviously pioneered by Tesla. Every EV has what's called a CAN bus in the internal gubbins, and this has parts which can uniquely identify a specific vehicle. With the Tesla supercharger network, it's always been possible to roll up to a charger, plug the nozzle in and walk away. The charger talks via the CAN bus to the car, identifies the make, model and VIN number and automatically links this to your Tesla account. The charge starts automatically and your account gets charged. If you own a Model S or a Model X, particularly the earlier ones, the supercharger costs are linked in with the purchase price of the car, so your fuel is effectively free. With the Model 3 and the Model Y, Tesla have started charging 24 pence per kilowatt hour. Now the beauty of this is that it's completely frictionless. Stop the car plug in the charger, walk away. No searching through apps, looking for RFID cards or payment methods or initiation processes. It is literally plug and charge. The reason you can do this with a Tesla is because this is a closed network. With very few exceptions, the only cars that can use the Tesla supercharger network are Teslas. So implementing and managing the plug and charge process is relatively simple. But it doesn't mean other networks can't do it. In fact, there exists a complete protocol and authentication system allowing networks to implement plug and charge on their devices. It's known as the ISO 15118 standard or 15118 standard. The Ionity network already supports plug and charge on their units in most European locations. Their counterpart stateside, Electrify America, 
has also implemented plug and charge on their devices. Charger manufacturer Tritium is building this standard into its new chargers and the RTM75 model already has it in place. Charger manufacturer ABB is also starting to put this standard into its chargers. But in order for this to work correctly, it needs a vehicle that can also support the plug and charge protocol. Outside the Tesla network, the only vehicle that currently supports this is the Porsche Taycan. It is a bit of a niche despite the high demand for that particular model of car. BMW have no short term plans for plug and charge, but are looking at it for future vehicles. The VW group is focusing on Audi and Porsche for their first rollout. And then when the luxury black brands have been done, they'll work their way down to the ID range and presumably the Skoda and Seat range. As far as the CPOs are concerned, the protocol exists. They need to implement it and communicate it to the vehicle manufacturers. That way, for example, ID3 drivers will soon be able to filter chargers on their sat nav to only include plug and charge capable ones and navigate there to refill. So there you have it. If you want to charge your car, there are numerous ways you can pay for it. Contactless, an ad hoc link to a payment site, RFID cards, apps, ZapPay, Octopus Electric Juice, and ultimately plug and charge. In an ideal world, the whole kit and caboodle would morph over to plug and charge. It's the easiest, most frictionless method, and it makes absolute sense that this would be the standard. But in order for that to work, a lot of the CPOs have to get out of their little siloed approach to data and spread a little interconnectivity love. It's notable that the one network that seems willing to work together with companies like ZapPay and Octopus Juice is Osprey Charging, who also provide live charger status updates to all the main EV route planning apps. And this is a result of App Osprey being very open with its communication protocols, as it recognises that this is vital to improving the charging experience. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Osprey Charging were one of the first CPOs to implement plug and charge on all their units. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with you listeners. Volkswagen Group Components have commenced battery recycling at its Salzgitter plant. The unique feature of the Salzgitter plant is that it only recycles batteries that can no longer be used for other purposes. And that is batteries which have been through the whole life cycle of powering a car, moving from there into static storage for batteries in a house, for example, and now being down to a state at which they're no longer fit for any purpose. The problem is that because of this, larger vo volumes of battery returns are not really expected until the late 2020s at the earliest. Therefore, the plant has been designed to initially recycle up to 3,600 battery systems per year during the pilot phase. This is equivalent to approximately 1,500 tonnes. In future, this system can be scaled up to handle larger quantities as the process is constantly optimised. The individual parts from the battery are ground into granules in a big shredder and then dried. And in addition to aluminium, copper and plastics, the process also yields what they call black powder, which contains the important raw materials for other batteries, such as lithium, nickel, manganese and cobalt, as well as graphite. These are separated and processed into individual substances uh, using water and chemical agents in a process that is carried out by specialised partners. The carbon dioxide savings are calculated at approximately 1.3 tonnes for a 62 kilowatt hour battery manufactured using cathodes made from recycled material and using green electricity. So we have the technology, we just need to use it. And that's your show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, please use the EV Musings Twitter account, Musings EV, or I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. If you want to support the podcast and the newsletter, please consider contributing to become an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. If you want a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and is a great little introduction to living with an electric car. At the moment, it's free on Kindle Unlimited or if you're in the Kindle Lending Library, please check it out. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available wherever you get your podcast. Please leave a review, preferably five stars, as it does help to raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know, over lockdown he wanted to install a slip and slide for his daughter. 
But he couldn't because he lives in a flat. He realised the issue is much bigger than just him, though. The people who can bluntly afford a house with a driveway will be- will benefit hugely compared to people who don't have that. Thanks for listening. Bye.